Triple E Media. I'm Ramat Mohammed, and this is The Backstory. On the evening of Tuesday, October 20th, shots were fired at the scene of a protest at Leki Tollgate in Lagos, Nigeria. Protesters had been gathered there since October 12th to speak out against Nigeria's special anti-robbery squad, also known as SARS, and to demand an end to police brutality. On the 20th, the Nigerian military was deployed throughout Lagos to restore law and order. We now know that the 65th Battalion of the Nigerian Army was at Leki Tollgate that evening. And according to Premium Times, the Nigerian Army admits to firing blank ammunition up in the air. But witnesses at the scene say people were killed and injured that evening. I am here with my colleagues, Antonietta Kalunta, Richard Anyebe, Alexandra Gekpe, and Stanley Bentu to discuss what we know and the implications of the investigation that is currently ongoing. Alexandra, why were protesters at Lecky Tollgate? Well, the protesters were there to call for an end to SARS. SARS stands for the Nigeria's Special Anti-Robbery Squad. SARS is an elite unit of the Nigeria Police Force, the components of which began in 1984, primarily in Lagos State. Mm -hmm. It was meant to deal with violent crimes like car theft, armed robbery and kidnapping by bandits following the end of the Nigerian Civil War in the 1970s. Mm. And it's actually worked for a while to reduce violent crime rates in southern Nigeria. But as the economy declined, crime became a lot more widespread. Hmm. So in 2002, SARS was expanded into all 36 states, including Abuja, the capital city. It was around this time that SARS operatives began to change. Although they were still operating in unmarked vehicles and in plain clothes, now these officers started carrying arms out in the open. The Inspector General of Police at the time, Tafa Balogun, launched Operation Fire for Fire. This was a new and much tougher strategy for fighting crime in Nigeria. So not only were these SARS officers armed, they were empowered to use these arms in plain clothes and in unmarked cars. Hmm. Ultimately, the countrywide expansion of SARS in 2002 meant that there was more opportunity for these operatives to interact with the public. This meant there was more opportunity for human rights abuse. Hmm. Okay, so if I understand you right, Alex, if, for example we have 100 SARS officers. And as part of this hypothetical, 1% were bad apples. Then we'd be looking at one bad apple officer who maybe has negative interactions with 10 people a day. Absolutely. But now if you expand SARS to 1,000 officers and you still have 1% that are bad apples, you would now have... 10 bad apple officers. And now if each of those 10 have 10 negative interactions per day, you now have 100 people who can report some kind of abuse by the police. And that's exactly what started to happen. From 2001 right into 2002, we start to see an increase in the number of allegations against SARS. I was able to find a report from Amnesty International from as early as 2002 that began to call out the Nigeria police force for specific human rights violations. Now, these included excessive use of force, 
torture, inhumane treatment of suspected criminals. There was also the failure to follow due process as well as the extrajudicial executions by the SARS officials. And it was also around that time from 2002 that we see more reports of SARS extorting money from ordinary civilians. Mm. And these corrupt practices are still ongoing. Now, to be fair, the Nigerian police do identify and deal with some internal corruption cases. For example, Amnesty reported that the Nigeria police force dismissed over 150 police officers for corruption just between April and May 2002. But despite maybe their best efforts, the police had a systemic problem that continued. Mm. Fast forward to December 2017, the BBC reported that youth had started the hashtag NSARS on social media. They even had a petition on Citizen Go. Now, at that point, the youth threatened to protest if the government did not end SARS. Speaking to a TVC news reporter, one young man actually shared his frustration about SARS. These people now do not understand their role anymore. And they have overstayed what they are doing, their relevance in this society. And that's why people are coming out today to say that let's end this unit of the police. Because when you have a SARS officer doing the work of an FRSC, you have a SARS officer doing the work of an NDLEA, you have a SARS officer doing the work of an EFCC officer, so, in fact, I would not be surprised if by tomorrow these people start um, intervening in marital issues. The police are... Now, on December 11, 2017, youth held a rally in Lagos, but the turnout was very low. A Premium Times report also stated that at one point during the rally, the number of reporters actually outnumbered protesters. Hmm. For months after this initial street protest, They continued their protest on social media. By August 2018, the Vice President Yemi Osimbajo, who was the acting president at the time, instructed the Inspector General of Police to overhaul the SARS unit. They organized this um, protest because we want justice for Kolade Johnson that was killed by the SARS officials unjustly. And we want justice for his family and we want justice for... On March 31st, 2019, Kolade Johnson, a 36-year-old man, was shot while watching a football match between Liverpool and Tottenham. He was shot during a police raid in his own neighbourhood. That was Kolade's sister, Elizabeth Hassan, speaking to Channel's television. This incident brought back the hashtag NSARS and again, protesters attempted to rally in Lagos on April 5th. But again, few people showed up. Hello and welcome to TVC News. Nigerian Football League side Remo Stars Football Club have confirmed the death of the club's assistant captain, Tiami Ukazim, who was allegedly assaulted by operatives of the Special Anti-Robbery Squad in Shagamu. According to a press release... On February 22, 2020, a footballer, Tiamiyu Kazim, was allegedly killed by SARS officials. On the 26th of February, the Inspector General of Police, Mohamed Adamu, announced that all SARS satellite offices would be closed. After that, Business Day newspaper released an article basically stating that closing the satellite offices was not enough. Mm -hmm. Therefore, they called for an end to SARS. On May the 11th, this day newspaper reported that 52-year-old businessman Solomon Eze had been shot by police in Karimo in Abuja. Now, it is unclear if it was the SARS unit, but either way, his killing led to riots. Oh, and by the way, there was a COVID-19 lockdown happening across the country at that time. Hmm. Alex, did the lockdown have any impact at all on how police interacted with civilians? Yes, of course. During the COVID-19 lockdown in Nigeria, the government empowered security forces to enforce the lockdown. 
that meant that only specific groups of people like healthcare workers and journalists, for example, were allowed to move around. And that basically meant that security forces were out on the streets, stopping cars, stopping pedestrians and checking for IDs. This again gave more opportunity and interaction for abuse. There was a report published by Al Jazeera on a specific incident of a woman named Pamela. She was stopped by police officers who were enforcing the government's COVID-19 guidelines and who accused her of not wearing a face mask. These police officers allegedly took her to a guest house where the officers allegedly raped her until the early hours of the morning. Alex, what else was happening as a result of this lockdown? Cost of living is very high. We cannot buy, when you buy today, tomorrow you come back and say the price will go up again. Well, in Nigeria, people live on income they make day to day. And even though the government attempted to close the gaps, it just wasn't enough. It was not even close. People were stuck at home without money, without food, and with nothing to do. And they were on social media more. Data companies were offering competitive prices, promos, you know, to encourage people to buy more data. So more and more people were online as a way to connect with each other. So as the government eased the lockdown, people came out to find that food costs more, electricity costs more, petrol costs more. So here's the situation. You've got high stress levels, people are more frustrated, there's more social media use, and everything is more expensive coming out of the COVID-19 lockdown. It was a perfect storm just brewing. By the time we get to October, everyone is already very angry. Okay, so that brings us to October. Thank you, Alex. Antonietta, Richard, what happened in October? So on the 3rd of October, Nicolas Makalomi posted a video on his Twitter that started to go viral in Nigeria. The video basically shows a man bleeding from his head and he appears to be unconscious. Then we see two men in a vehicle and they're chasing after another vehicle. Save that Augele. Save that Augele. See them. Zero, 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 the men were in pursuit of the Nigerian police. When this video was posted on Twitter, the narrative around it was that the Nigerian police, and specifically the special anti-robbery squad, SARS, had shot a man and were speeding away with his car. This video caused an outcry on social media. Richard, what was the government's response to this video? Well, the government's first reaction to the video was by the Delta State Police Command in a press conference where they explained in greater details the events of that day. So basically, on the 3rd of October... Operatives of Safe Delta Squad in Ugeli, while on patrol along Wari Ugeli by Wetland Hotel Ugeli, observed a white-colored Lesus Jeep without registration number. And on seeing the police team, the driver of the car zoomed off at high speed and in a suspicious manner. Consequently, the team gave them a hot chase and they successfully intercepted the vehicle and arrested the two occupants. On their way to the station, one of the suspects jumped out of the moving vehicle and sustained body and head injuries. While the police officers tried to rescue him, an angry mob came out to attack the officers. This made them to leave the scene without the suspects. Richard, it really does seem like the original post, at the very least, was misleading. That's right. However, the Inspector General of Police, Mohamed Adamu, announced the immediate ban of specific activities that SARS officers and other tactical units were engaging in. Some of these activities included routine patrols, stop and search duties, checkpoints, mounting of roadblocks, and even traffic checks. And that was on the 4th of October. But 
at this point, the video posted on the 3rd of October had already gone viral. People started to use the hashtag NSAS to share stories and personal experiences of alleged SARS brutality and to call for an end to the police unit. At Amitari tweeted on the 4th of October, we really need to end SARS. My brother was picked up when he went to get groceries. A young boy who isn't even in uni yet, dragged and put in the boots like an animal. If I didn't escort him that day, I would probably be mourning by now and you all will type RIP. And Theonetta, we just heard from Richard that the Inspector General of Police had suspended certain SARS activities. Does that make any difference at all? No. Remember that people had already heard this before. You heard Alex mention that Vice President Yemi Osibanjo had ordered an overhaul of the unit back in December of 2018. And then the IG closed SARS satellite offices in early 2020. So for many people, they have been hearing reform, reform over and over again. But at the same time they were hearing about these reforms, they also kept hearing about incidents involving SARS. Hmm. So that's why this time, the protesters decided to take their protests to the streets. We are saying today, we are saying today, as a citizen of this country, we can no longer be afraid of our country. We can no longer be a foreigner in our country. We are here, we are here to declare to every citizen. On the 7th of October, youth in Lagos began a 72-hour protest. And just like all the other protest attempts that Alex told you about, this one also did not start out with a large crowd. And while that was still taking place, we see the Speaker of the House of Representatives, Femi Bajabia Miller, who on the 7th of October disclosed some plans by the Assembly, basically to tackle police brutality across the country. And specifically, the House wanted to establish a system of independent accountability for the force. By the 8th of October, other states like Abuja, Edo, Kwara, and Imo had joined the protests. The protesters in Lagos went to the National Assembly for negotiations. And at this point, the protests were very much peaceful. But over in Ogeli, Delta State, where we had the viral video, a policeman was shot dead. By the 9th, another policeman was shot at Oshobo and his AK-47 with 25 live rounds of ammunition was taken away. And at this point, the president, Muhammad Buhari, on the 9th of October, ordered the Inspector General of Police, Muhammad Adamu, to address some of the concerns raised by Nigerians. The president particularly ordered the IG to reform SARS nationwide. By now, the 72 hours NSAS protests in Lagos had officially ended, but the convener said they were not backing down until the government scraps SARS. Not reform, not rebrand, but an absolute end to the police unit. So the protesters agreed to resume at 9 a.m. on the 10th. On the 10th, Protesters were at various locations around Lagos, including the Lagos State House of Assembly at Alausa, Maryland, or Jota, Ketu, Ikeja, Egbeda, Bega, and other places. Even outside of Lagos, in other cities like Oyo, Oshun, Kaduna, Enugu, and others, protesters were also beginning demonstrations. At this point on the 10th, the demonstrations were largely still peaceful. But we do start to see tensions rise. Mm -hmm. In Oyo, Jimo Isiaka was shot dead mm. and seven others injured during protests. In Oshun, protesters and police reportedly exchanged shots in front of the government house. Mm. So, Antionetta, while these tensions are rising on the ground, what's going on on social media? Well, the hashtag NSAS 
on social media started to gain momentum. It had support from artists like Fowles, Run Town, Burner Boy, football stars like Iron Wright, Leon Balogun, Ahmed Musa, international artists like Trey Songs, Big Sean, and some Nigerian politicians like Atiku were all lending their voices to the cause. And it was at this point on the 11th of October the Special Anti-Robbery Squad of the Nigerian Police, otherwise known as SARS, that the Inspector General of Police, is hereby dissolved across all formations. The 36 state officially disbanded SARS. Well, SARS was disbanded, yes, but the protesters still had five additional demands that the government must meet in order to get them off the streets. Roots TV and other news organizations followed Davido, the popular music artist, as he read these five demands when he met with the IG. Immediate release of all arrested protesters, justice for all deceased victims of police brutality and appropriate compensation for their families, setting up an independent body to oversee the investigation and prosecution of all reports of police misconduct, psychological ev evaluation and retraining of all disbanded SARS officers before they can be redeployed. Mm -hmm. Increased police salary. The protesters gave the government a deadline of November 2nd to meet these five demands. That's basically three weeks. Wow. So the protesters decided that they would stay on the streets until all demands are implemented. About 5 a.m. on the 12th of October, protesters in Lagos blocked the Lekito Gate. Now, Lagos is one of Nigeria's most popular cities and the country's economic capital as it produces more than a third of Nigeria's GDP. And this Lekki Ekpe Expressway, where the toll gate is located, is the main link between Victoria Island and the Lekki Peninsula in the state. So these protesters park some cars and then form a line in front of the toll, holding each other's hands. This had major impact on traffic. Hmm. Thing is, this particular toll was expanded to eight lanes in order to accommodate heavy traffic. But still, motorists are usually caught in a gridlock as they wait their turn to pay the toll and move on. So on a good day... This toll gate plays host to about nearly 90,000 cars daily. You can imagine the impact a blockade of the toll gate would have. People spent hours in traffic. Some even had to find alternative routes. So basically everyone was made uncomfortable. The government was made uncomfortable. Fellow citizens were made uncomfortable too. Now, in Surulere, the traffic actually proved to be deadly. A bus driver, Ikechuku Iluamuzo, who was stuck in traffic, was killed by a stray bullet fired during the protests. He bled to death from the gunshot wound. It was at this point, on the 12th of October, that the Presidential Panel on Police Reforms met and approved the five demands made by the NSAS protesters. So, Antheonetta, now that the demands have been met, everything is calm, right? Well, not quite. On the 13th of October, the IG of police announced the creation of another unit called SWAT, which means the Special Weapons and Tactics. The unit is meant to replace the disbanded SARS. The protesters thought this move was hasty, and so they were not happy. That same day, they went to the National Assembly in Abuja, but were stopped from entering by the Nigerian military. Some of the protesters reported being injured in the process. And on the 14th of October, we see a press statement on the Nigerian Army official Facebook page. In the statement, they confirmed their allegiance to the president and to the constitution. The statement says that the Nigerian army remains highly committed to defend the country and her democracy at all costs. And they said they are ready to deal with any situation decisively to maintain law and order in the country. Meanwhile, more states had started to join the protests and it's around the 14th and 15th that we really start to see the protests take a different turn. Hmm. On the 14th of October, we see a tweet from Jack Dorsey, who is the CEO of Twitter. And the tweet said, 
donate via Bitcoin to help hashtag NSARS. And he references a link to an organization called the Feminist Coalition. According to their site, the coalition had been formed only three months earlier in July of 2020 by a group of self-described young Nigerian feminist women. Their Twitter account at feminist underscore co was opened in October of 2020. And their Instagram account, which was also opened in October 2020, is based in the United Kingdom. When the NSARS movement began, this coalition decided to use their platform, which was initially focused on the advancement of the Nigerian woman, to raise funds for NSARS. By October 22nd, that's after 14 days of fundraising for NSAS, the Feminist Coalition claimed to have received over 147 million naira, the equivalent of about 400,000 US dollars. And what was this money being used for? Well, when I last checked, their website was no longer working. The server cannot be found. But according to archives, as of October 22nd, about 40% of the money was used to provide food, water, medical aid, security, and legal aid to protesters. The coalition said it will channel the remaining to additional items like relief for victims of police brutality and families of the deceased, memorial for the fallen, and NSAS mental health support. Their last Instagram and Twitter posts were on the 22nd of October. Okay, so let's get back to the protests. We now have significant funds that are flowing in starting 14th of October. What happens next? As these funds were flowing in to the NSAS movement, on the 15th, disruptors went with sticks, cutlasses, and daggers to attack peaceful protesters in Alausa, Lagos State. And who are these disruptors? Well, we don't really know for sure, but some people believe that they were paid by the government to disrupt the protests. Others believe they were hoodlums taking advantage of the protests. But generally, these are angry, mostly poor youngsters just set out to disrupt. But the Lagos state government was quick to refute the allegation. In a statement by the Commissioner for Information in the state, Benga Omotosho, he said the state government did not sponsor hoodlums to disrupt the protest. The attacks still continued. On the 16th, armed men attacked protesters in Bini, chasing them with machetes and were reported to even shoot in the air. That Friday evening, protesters blocked the Abuja Airport Road which connects the city center to the airport. Even I couldn't get home that night. I had to sleep at the office. Mm. So by the 17th, the protesters in Surulere, Lagos, started to move with dogs as guards against these disruptors. On the 18th, protesters in Abuja blocked the Central Bank of Nigeria headquarters. Now, when the government realized that the protesters were targeting strategic locations, they deployed soldiers to these locations on the 18th of October. And one of these locations was the popular AY roundabout, which is the major entry and exit point into the capital city, and as well as the Good Luck Jonathan Expressway, which is the road leading to the international airport, as well as the CBN headquarters, which is obviously another very important government asset, and also the police force headquarters, the Supreme Court, and the National Assembly. As the government was doing all of that, on the 19th, the Abuja protesters divided themselves so they can operate from various locations. A protester in Kubwa, Anthony Onome, was stabbed and later died in the hospital. On the 19th, still, prisoners in Edo State were reported to have escaped. Still on the 19th, protesters blocked a strategic warehouse junction in Imo State, crippling commercial activities in the state. Same day, pandemonium broke out in Abuja as a group of people attacked some of the protesters and destroyed property and burned cars in the Kabusa area of Apomechanic. As this tension continued to rise, 
we see several parties began calling for calm. And one of these parties was the Nigerian Governors Forum. They asked the NSAS protesters to end their demonstrations across the country. As the chaos was building up, the Minister of Defense, retired Major General Bashir Magashi, released a statement signed by his spokesman, Mohammed Abdul Kadri. And in the statement, he cautioned the NSAS protesters against breaching national security. Okay, so it seems like a lot happened on the 19th. And the government has now issued a word of caution. Antonietta, what happens on the 20th? Well, actually, before Antonietta gets to that point, let me just add that on the 19th of October, we see the governor of Lagos State, Babajide Sanwolu, swore in a judicial panel of inquiry and restitution to investigate cases of brutality related to SARS in the state. That same day, he ordered all students to stay at home. So on the 20th, three police stations were set on fire. A police station in Orile Gamu was set on fire at 9.45 a.m. Two other stations, the Paco police station in Amukoko and Lioni police station in Ajegunde were also set on fire. All of these police stations are in Lagos State. Still in the state, a police officer was allegedly lynched in Orile. At 11.49 a.m., Governor Sawolu tweeted that a 24-hour curfew was to start that same day at exactly 4 p.m. And his tweet reads, I have watched with shock how what began as a peaceful NSAS protest has degenerated into a monster that is threatening the well-being of our society. Lives and limbs have been lost as criminals and miscreants are now hiding under the umbrella of this protest to unleash mayhem on our state. At 10.04 a.m., the morning of the 20th, DJ Switch posted a video on her Instagram. DJ Switch is a Nigerian music artist. And in the post, she says that the protests are just not enough. I want to tell the government that it actually hasn't reached boiling point. When it reaches boiling point, you will know. Check your history. There is nowhere in the world where change for the people has actually taken place without sacrifice, without blood running, without violence. By the time the curfew was announced, the protesters insisted that they were not going anywhere for two reasons. One, the government shouldn't impose a curfew to stop them from assembling, which they have a right to. And two, the government cannot impose a curfew to be effective in barely four hours. And in order to address the concern by the tight deadline, the governor extended the curfew to 9 p.m. After that announcement, we see a high deployment of security agents to Lagos in order to enforce the 24-hour curfew. At this point, at the Lekki toll gate, news of security forces making their way to Lekki was spreading through the crowd. Some protesters did leave, but the remaining that chose to stay behind began to form a human chain around each other. They were not going anywhere. According to Al Jazeera reports, at 6.29 p.m., military vehicles were filmed leaving Bonnie Camp. Instagram feed by DJ Switch that you just heard was obtained by Premium Times and it shows that she went live at about 6.47 p.m. At this point, tweets were already coming in. At 6.44, Omoni Oboli tweets, they are shooting at peaceful protesters at the Lekki Toll. 6.51, Yemisi Adegoke tweets, at Rio Banjo is a Lekki Toll Gate. She's reporting that they are shooting at protesters. 6.53, a tweet from Samuel Otigba. Military trucks, Lagos, Lekki Tollgate, shooting peaceful protesters. 6.57, Peter Okoye tweets. Nigerian soldiers shooting at Lekki Tollgate, 
now. 9.04 p.m. Amnesty International tweets, received credible but disturbing evidence of excessive use of force occasioning deaths of protesters at Lekki Tollgate in Lagos. 11.46 p.m. The Nigerian Army Headquarters tweeted, fake news. They were refuting a news report by Sahara reporters, which claimed that soldiers opened fire on peaceful protesters at the Lekki Tollgate. The Army tweet said, no soldier were at the scene of the shooting. Mm. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Antonietta. Alex, what do we know now? Well, we now know that the Nigerian army were at the Lekki Toll Gate that night. And how did we come to find that out? As you heard from Richard, after the media began to allege that the army was on site, the Nigerian army tweeted on their handle that no soldiers were at the scene. That was on the 20th. They again denied involvement on the 21st. On the 22nd, the governor of Lagos, who is the chief security officer of his state, denied any involvement. On the 23rd, both Lagos governor and the military denied there was a shooting. It was not until the 24th that we finally get an admission. Governor Samwolu of Lagos was being interviewed by CNN. And during this interview, he was asked... Who ordered people to be shot? And which branch of security services carried out the shootings? And he responded... It seems to me that there will be um, men in military uniform which will be Nigerian um, army or something. So you're saying that it was military officers who ordered peaceful protesters that's, be shot at Lekki Yeah, that's what Lekki the pictures, Tollgate. yes. They were there, that's what the footage, I mean, that's what it shows. Three days later, Tuesday the 27th, a statement by a military spokesman, Major Oshoba Olani, said soldiers were sent to enforce a curfew. But the statement denied that the troops shot at the protesters. And in this same statement, he also said, and I quote, the decision to call in the military was taken by the Lagos state government after a 24-hour curfew was imposed. He also added in the statements that, and I quote, the intervention of the military followed all laid down procedures for internal security operations and all the soldiers involved acted within the confines of the rules of engagement for internal security operations. Hmm. And of course, we now know that they also fired shots while there. That's right. According to Premium Times, the army has now admitted to firing blank ammunition up in the air. That admission was reportedly made in a petition. That petition was submitted to the Judicial Panel of Inquiry. Well, thank you so much, Alex. Stanley, hi. Hi, Ramat. After hearing everything that we just heard, I have a ton of questions, but the one that I really want an answer to is, will we ever know what actually happened here? Will we ever get to a point of closure on this? Well, we may never know exactly what happened at Lecky that evening. The details are just too sketchy, and uh, even though the panel of inquiry has been set up, uh, there are two challenges here. Uh, first and foremost, to what degree can the panel of inquiry actually get to the bottom of everything that happened blow by blow? Nigeria has a history of um, panels of inquiries being set up. Uh, for example, back in 2001, there was the uh, late Justice Nikitobi panel of inquiry mm -hmm. that was assigned to determine the uh, immediate and remote causes of the Joss crisis of September 7th, 2001. Uh, th that panel completed its report and handed it in. And up until today, uh, nothing has really been done. And the details of that report has not even been made public. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have the Steve Oronsaye uh, panel assigned to basically reduce the cost of government. And this is by uh, 
collapsing some of the government uh, ministries, departments and agencies so that funds can be freed up. And the police could have enjoyed a bit of some of these freed up funds to improve on, on uh, its operations. Uh, but this has not been implemented, even though the details of this particular report uh, has been made public. So we have a lot of reports that have not been implemented. And the governor of Lagos State himself did say in an interview that um, he cannot give a guarantee that people would be held to account because he's just the governor of the state. And all he was going to do at the end of the day was to take it up with the relevant authorities. And the panel of inquiry in this case is headed by the state government, right? I, I think even the governor himself is is heading that panel, right? And this is a point of controversy. Can one stand trial in a case that one is presiding over? The governor of Lagos State played a critical part. Um, the military had said that the governor had extended an invitation to it to intervene and enforce the curfew, which makes him a critical witness if we're going to get down to uh, understanding what happened in Lekki that day. So it raises a lot of questions as to uh, how we're ever going to find closure or what closure even really means for Nigeria. And uh, that is something that the Nigerian people are going to have to decide for themselves. What do we want to come out of these inquiries? Do we simply want the names of people we can blame? Or do we want to find points where the system failed and fix those gaps so that we do not repeat the same mistakes in the future. There is plenty of blame to go around. The protesters, the disruptors, social media, traditional media, the police, the military, the governor, maybe even the presidency. We all share some blame. Assigning blame is the easy part, and we're really good at that. But what if we approach these inquiries not as a way to assign blame, but as a way to truly uncover what went wrong so we can fix the system? For example, on Saturday the 14th, the military testified at the inquiry, and they shared two pieces of information that I found interesting, and I found them interesting because these are gaps that had they been closed, they may have mitigated the incident at Lecky. If you remember, the governor on the 20th tweeted that the curfew was to start at 4 p.m., and then the time was changed to 9 p.m. to allow people to get home. Commander Ibrahim Taiwo, who testified for the military at the inquiry, shared that both of these timings were not communicated to the army. Had they been aware that the curfew was pushed back to 9 p.m., would they have approached the situation in a different way? Maybe, just maybe, they would have waited until 9 p.m., before trying to enforce the curfew. And maybe by then, most of the protesters at Lecky would have gone home. In the future, what will the military and governors put in place to ensure that they are always communicating updated information that is critical to their mission? The second piece of information he shared was that the approval to deploy came from the chief of army staff. It is still unclear how the chief of army staff got his authority to order that deployment. So, it should be clear to anyone following that the authorities, the military, police, all have multiple points of failure that they need to address, but... When we are looking at points of failure, let's also look at our own failures as citizens. What are we saying on social media? What are we sharing? And then as media practitioners and international human rights organizations, how can we continue to improve on the accuracy, fairness, completeness, 
and respect in our communications. So fellow Nigerians, I leave you with this question. What does justice and closure look like for us? Is it simply that we find people to blame and then punish them? Is it that we find the victims and we give them money? Or is justice making sure that the multiple points of failure, which led to Lecky in the first place, do not happen again? This episode of The Backstory was made by Antonieta Kalunta, Richard Anyabe, Alexandra Gekpe, John Iwodi, Abubakar Abdullahi Sadiq, Dominic Ranjuma Tabakaji, and Sam Tabakaji. Special thanks to Stanley Bentu, Mala Iwa Bagdo Ikaleku, and Rabia Hadeja. I'm Ramat Mohammed. See you next week. Episodes of The Backstory can be found on our YouTube channel. Just search for 234 Audio. For even more immersive audio content, download the 234 Audio app on your Android or Apple device today. And check us out on our website at 234audio.com.